Hey everyone, um, I've got an exciting news. So my dear friend and talented author Samantha Finn recently released her second children's book called Wombat Wiggle. So this is a story about a wombat who's afraid of the dark, particularly the dark of the night, until one day he discovered that there is more to the night than just darkness. Sam has given me the honor to illustrate her second children's book, so thank you Sam. Uh, because of COVID, we couldn't do any launch event, so in replacement, we're doing this launch video instead. In this video, we'll do a reading of the whole book, and then I will talk you through about the creation process of the book. Um, everything from sketch, finding ideas, references, all the way to the digital drawing process. And then at the end of the video, we'll give you links if you want to buy the book. So let's start with the reading. Once in a while, in the land upside down, a little creature can sometimes be found. A little marsupial, all hairy and fat, you know who I mean, it's the humble wombat. Now, one little wombat would venture alone to collect up his food and then hurry back home. He was sure to be back before the sun went to bed as the thought of night time filled him with dread. For this little wombat from Royal Sin Park was not tired or hungry, he was afraid of the dark. He would hurriedly borrow to get back inside, which was sometimes a challenge with a massive behind. So he wouldn't get stuck at the door of his den, he would shimmy his bottom now and again. A bip and a boop a shimmy and a jiggle, something he called the Royal Sun Wiggle. He'd move to the left, then nudge to the right, wiggling inside before he got stuck out at night. But one fateful day, a storm hit the park, and by the time he found home, it was already dark. And this little wombat, try as hard as he might, just couldn't escape the darkening night. No shimmy or shake, no tapping or wriggle, this storm was too much for the royal sun wiggle. When he finished his dance, a tragic loss caused, to his great surprise, he heard thunderous applause. He looked up, he looked down, he looked all around, who, where, or what was the source of the sound? A little cooey from way up above, a little hello filled with friendship and love. Hi there, I'm the moon, he heard the voice say. I've been excited to meet you, and today is the day. We love your dance, we see it each day, but before we can clap, you hurry away. There's no need to be scared of us in the sky. The stars are old friends, those who've passed by. When the sun goes to sleep and she calls it the day, the planets and stars, we all come out to play. There's no need to fear us as you scurry back home. The night may seem lonely, but you're never alone. We watch you as you dance, you scamp, and you squiggle, but tonight we can applaud the great wombat wiggle. The night isn't scary, despite all the dark, we love you dear wombat of Royalston Park. So this little wombat was never alone, collecting his food and then heading back home. He was sure to be back as the sun went to bed, but no rushing this time, no fear and no dread. Taking his time to perform with a giggle, for his friends up above, the great wombat wiggle. Alright, let's talk about creative process behind wombat wiggle. Every artist have a different creative process. Some are quite meticulous, some are quite organic. I would say I'm somewhere in between. I never had the patience to go through a very structured, meticulous process. I think um, it's just the way I am. 
I've always been like this since I was at uni, all of my lectures and friends um, and at work as well. My supervisor always told me that I'm really organic in the way I work. Um, that's just the way I am. But either way, some kind of process needs to be in place in order for me to be able to produce a better result um, and also faster. I had to learn this the hard way. So when I did my first children's book back in 2019, so it was this one called Gigi Goes to Town by the same author, Sam. Um, it was really my first time doing a project to this scale. So I didn't really do any proper research or follow any particular process. I just kind of decided to wing it. And it took me about a whole year, so it's, it was quite long. And some some days it can be quite challenging. Um, and then in the end, like I was happy with the result, but I realized there's a lot of things that I can improve in terms of how I actually produce the work. So with the second book, I have actually followed a more structured process. Um, in summary, um, there are five stages. So the first one is storyboarding. The second one is visual concept and references. The third one is sketches. The fourth one is um, digital painting. And then the fifth one is printing setup. And I will talk you through about each process one by one. Whenever I'm working on a big illustration project like this one, I always start with giving the project a name and designing the typeface or the logo of the project. So this makes the project feels real and personal to me. If someone's having a baby, this is like the fun bit where they get to explore different baby names that they think might be suitable for the baby. So this is my baby, he's a bit of a square baby. Um, and this typeface here was the first thing I did before I do anything else. I always find typeface design really fascinating because just using certain characteristics of letters, how you arrange them, how you color them, you get to convey certain message, emotion, or even a story. So you have to be really clever and creative about it. We'll talk about this more. Um, once I'm happy with the typeface, the next thing is storyboarding. So I usually receive the story from Sam in a form of a Microsoft Word. So that'd be just like sentences or paragraph. Um, and I have to basically read the whole thing and then start thinking how I can split the sentences or the paragraphs and put them on separate pages to start seeing how many pages do I actually have to illustrate. So we'll talk about this more. This is what my storyboard looks like. After reading the whole story, I started organizing the paragraphs of the story into pages. This was all done in PowerPoint. It is important for me to organize the paragraphs in a page spread format like this, so I can see how the paragraphs sit side by side. This way, I can make sure all the illustration flows nicely from one page to another. Later on, each time I completed a page, I started filling in the pages with the sketches and eventually the digital version of it. This way, I can constantly check on how the overall flow of the illustration looking throughout the process. A few times, I had to redraw or split or combine certain pages when I feel like the visual isn't flowing nicely. For the logo design of the book, I wanted to ensure it really captures the context of the story and the characteristics of our main character. The swirls around the logo was inspired by the fact that wombats live in burrows. You'll notice I also capitalized the word wombat to represent the chubbiness of a wombat and tilted the position of the letters in the word wiggle to give it a sense that it's moving. I took reference from how Marvel Cinematic Universe designed their movie franchise logos. Influenced by superhero comic style typeface, I find that their typeface design is well thought, ensuring its shapes, colors, textures, positioning represents the context of the movie and its main character. The visual concept and references stage is about doing research and tons of trials and errors. If illustrating is like cooking, this is the bit where I'd be collecting ingredients, mixing them up in a bowl, and then tasting it as I go to see if it tastes good or if it tastes bad. I remember during this stage, I went quite often to national parks to take pictures of landscapes, animals, and plants. I had to look at tons of pictures of wombats to understand what they look like. Also other Australian animals, birds, mammals, reptiles, and spiders as well. If you're in Australia, you gotta look at the spiders. I also look at other children's book as a reference. Uh, the two that I really like is called The Bear, The Piano, and Little Bear's Concert by David Litchfield. This one has a really touching story and really beautifully illustrated. And the second one is called The Midnight Titi by Michelle Toy. Um, so these two, I really recommend it. 
these two are really really good book um, and it's really beautifully illustrated I also look at um, animated movies anything from Netflix Disney Pixar DreamWorks Ghibli as well and I will talk you through about two particular movies that I use as a reference for Wombat Legal. Let's start with the character design. So this is the original design for our main character. I originally designed him to look super cute, almost looking like a baby wombat. Um, as you can see, he has facial features like really big googly eyes, um, really tiny, almost round um, body shape, uh, pretty like tiny stature in general. Um, I showed this to Sam, my author, and she really liked it. She said it actually reminded her of her newborn son. Um, but then I thought about it, because the story of this book is going to be a wombat who's afraid of the dark, I thought it might be almost like too sad if I designed the wombat to look almost like a baby. So I wanted to actually revisit the design and then maybe make him look a bit more um, like stronger but also at the same time still a bit timid and shy um, I think because in general we want that contrast to be able to tell the feelings of the wombat being scared better so I took reference from a couple of characters so you might be familiar with this guy he's Obelix from Asterix and Obelix and Rubius Hagrid from Harry Potter two really famous characters um, you can see that these two characters, they're big and strong characters, but they're also known for their gentle personality. And in character design, you can actually achieve that by making a character with a large body proportion and pretty round in general um, to make it more uh, friendly. And when one thing that you can actually do to tone down their personality and strength is by creating a pretty small like facial feature. So you can see like both of them have really small eyes really small face area in comparison to their body and you can also see that particularly like Hagrid here it look I mean that's just the way the actor Robbie Coltrane is but they portrayed him with like really big clothings um, and really big hair you can see like only really small hands and small facial area and that makes him look almost like shy even though he looks pretty strong um, I took a lot of reference from this book which I highly recommend this is called Creating Stylized Characters by 3D Total Publishing. It's a really good book. It'll show you like a lot about character design and then how shapes actually determine the personality of a character and how it's being perceived. So I would totally recommend this book. Um, so yeah, these two main characters are the one that I actually use. So then I look at tons of pictures of wombats and I actually realized that the real proportion of a real wombat is already pretty similar to the two references. You can see that a real wombat has a pretty like bulky body. Um, I mean wombat is seen as a pretty cute animal but they also like look like a bulky like walking tank in general. So yeah, you can see like a pretty like square-ish body shape, um, pretty broad like shoulder and a, a bit of a trapezoid um, head shape, but you can see really small eyes, small ears and this tiny cute little feet. Um, these are the features that I actually want to apply to our main character. So then I designed the final design to be like this, pretty close to the real wombat. You can see, um, you know, it's pretty close to the original wombat, pretty wide body, looking pretty strong, but I decided to create the timidness by giving him really small eyes, this almost like sad, unsure looking eyebrow, rosy cheeks, big round nose, small ears, and I've also decided to give him a bit of a curly fringe at the top, and I also do this for a reason. Um, another reference that I use you're probably familiar with these three characters, um, Violet from The Incredibles, Sadness from Inside Out, and Boo from Monsters, Inc. Um, do you see a similarity between these three? So all of them in the movies, or at least at the start, they're all portrayed as a pretty shy, timid character. And you can see that their facial features is quite similar. They all have um, a fringe that almost covering like their whole face, like or a portion of their face. Um, they both have pretty rosy cheeks, um, Violet and Boo. 
and then the eyebrows also looking kind of like sad or unsure so these are basically the reference that i used to create the facial feature of my wombat so i took the body proportion uh, from rubius hagrid and oblix to make the wombat look big and strong but then the facial feature i kind of follow these three to make it look more timid and shy so yeah this is the sketches that i made at the beginning so usually when i design a character after i'm happy with the overall design i started drawing the character in different posts to see what he looks like from different angle from the side from the top um also try to see like how he would move how would he would turn because that'll really help me give a sense of what the actual character looks like overall and does it actually work or not So as you can see, even though each artist have their own unique style, we all actually help and learn each other by referencing each other's works. The image moodboard on the left shows examples of other concept artists, illustrators, and animators that influence my works. Creative professionals like Izzy Burton, Hayao Miyazaki, Charles Santoso, and movies like How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda, Klaus, and Finding Nemo all provide a great study materials for me. The key is about taking those references and study them and make it your own version. The image mood board on the right are example of my own works. So a big part of my improvement over the years actually comes from practices and learning from other people. Earlier in my days, I used to be more determined to be unique and not willing to use reference. But then I realized that the more I am actually exposed to other people's works and willing to learn from them, the more I actually get to expand my own skills. You might remember these colorful dudes, the Care Bears. They're a pretty old cartoon, I remember growing up seeing them on TV. Honestly, I don't know if they still exist anymore or not. So you remember how I personified the stars in the book by making them into some kind of fairies or animal spirits? I actually took reference from the Care Bears design and made my version of it for the book. You'll notice how I make them all very colorful like the Care Bears and gave them stars on their belly. Besides referencing from other people's works, I also reference things in real life. Like I said earlier, during the creation of this book, I went for walks in the national parks quite a lot, almost every weekend. I took pictures of native plants and after I came home, I started drawing them and compiled them into a bank of plants that I plan to use in my book. I also started to take interest in gardening, bought a lot of flowers and used them as a study reference for the plants in my book. You can see here I have applied a distinct color palette for the day and night setting of the story. For the day scenes, I use a lot of red, a lot of orange and yellow as well, lots of warm light, and whenever I use green, I use more of a dark, olive, yellowy or army green. While for the night scenes, I use a lot more purple, magenta, blue, more neon lighting, and whenever I use green, I use more of a teal, turquoise kind of green. It's important that I stay consistent to this color palette system because I really wanted to show the contrasting feeling between the day and night that our wombat is experiencing in the story. The night scenes need to be quite magical rather than scary so I've decided to introduce quite a lot of vibrant and neon color rather than making it muted like night in real life. So because I wanted the visuals of the book to have a distinct palette for when the story takes place during the day and during the night, I picked two movies that I use as a reference, one for the day and one for the night. The first one is Disney's animated movie Brother Bear, uh, released in 2003 and in my opinion is one of the most underrated Disney movie. It's a story about a man who lost his brother to this big female bear while they are hunting and as an act of revenge the main character Kinai killed the bear. He was then cursed by the spirits of his ancestors and transformed into a bear. And along his journey, wandering around in the wilderness, he met one particular bear cub, really annoying but really cute, who grew very attached to him and then he learns how to see the life from a perspective of a bear. The movie has a very deep and touching story, not to mention it is absolutely beautifully animated. Good music by Phil Collins too. Anyways, um, so the story of the movie takes place in kind of early human civilization in North America when the humans are still kind of like hunting and living in tribes. Um, and the landscape art of this movie is quite amazing. A lot of forests and plains and mountains. The color palette is quite warm and but also cool at the same time. So it reminds me a bit of New South Wales, particularly areas like Mount Kosciuszko. I remember as a kid, I was so mesmerized with the idea of the story, how when humans and animals died, 
their spirits both live in the northern lights as animals, which gave me the idea on how to visualize the personified stars in this book. So in Australia, wombats are actually found in more of the foresty parts of Australia rather than in the outback and on, in the red dirt parts. But I do want to bring a bit of both into the book. Um, so that's the best part of being an illustrator. You actually just get to decide and construct your own universe without boundaries. For the night scenes reference, I used one episode from Netflix animated show Love, Death and Robots called Fish Night. This anthology of short animated films have really deep story and crazy plot twists and very creative and edgy animation style. Disclaimer though, uh, the show is not for kids so don't tell your kids to watch it. The theme is quite mature and can be violent at times, or more like all the times really. The story of the movie is about these two salesmen that are stranded in the middle of a desert when their car broke down, so they had to spend the night there. Turns out, this desert used to be at the bottom of the ocean and it's now haunted, but more like in a beautiful way, so when the night falls, echoes or spirits of the past ocean animals comes out and relieve their moment throughout the night. The color palette of this episode is very very mesmerizing, um, it's quite vibrant and very neon, and the lighting is a really good reference for my night scenes as well. I particularly studied the compositions and how the spirits of this ocean animal floats and moves in the air, so I applied quite a lot of similar compositions in Wombat Wiggle's night scenes, and how it's being positioned in relation to our main characters. Even though everything in this book is drawn digitally using Adobe Photoshop software and a drawing tablet with a drawing pen like this one, and these are connected to my computer, at the beginning I actually still did everything um, traditionally using paper and pencil. So for every single page in the book, I created um, a sketch version first. So I'll show you like a few here and I'll show you more. Um, I still find that um, using this visual method gets my idea flowing better, um, particularly at the initial stage. Um, with computer, like I find we're always tempted to create everything so perfectly from the start. And when you just want to get your idea flowing, it's actually better to just use pencil and paper because you're more encouraged to make mistakes. Um, and then that way you can actually explore more rather than doing everything digitally straight away. The total page count of Wombat Wiggle is 26 pages. So the first two weeks of the process was spent in doing hand sketch for every single one of them. For a project like this, I prefer to do it in loose papers. That way it's easier for me to get an overview of how the pages look side by side and how they flow from one to another. I can also rearrange and swap the order of the illustrations, which I actually end up did for several pages that has quite similar scenery. On the contrary of you may think, I actually prefer to work in a slightly noisy or busy environment. At home, I usually put my own music playlist that I specifically made to represent the vibe of the illustration that I am working on, or have the TV on and play some visually inspiring movies like animated movies. I actually did most of my Wombat Wiggle sketches sitting at Starbucks. I don't know why, but noises and movements actually inspires me. There's something about dead silence that actually blocks my inspiration. If you're wondering about the names of my coffee cups, so my Indonesian name always make the baristas go like, what? So each time I order a drink on days that I'm sketching at Starbucks, I use different Avengers name, like Tony Stark, or Peter, or Bruce, and luckily I finished the sketches before the baristas who worked there started noticing that I changed my name every single day. So my sketching process takes about 20 to 40 minutes per sketch. Some artists prefer to draw a very rough sketch for this stage, so more like doodles, and they don't get too caught in perfecting every little detail and lines. But since I actually enjoy the sketching process, I usually spend a bit more time making the sketch itself looks nice. I don't go too far into details, that's something that I will develop later in the digital painting process, but I do try to get the overall drawing completed. You can see here some before and after samples of the pages. As you can see, they are pretty much stayed true to the original sketches, but with additional elements, characters, and environment added during the digital painting process. Now we're on the main show. 
The digital painting process takes up the most time throughout the whole book creation process. This is where the most fun and the most challenges occurs. I spent countless hours trying to transform those sketches that I showed you earlier into its digital form. There are so many things to consider. Lighting, colors, textures, details, contrast balance and composition. I also have to rethink if some of the sketches didn't turn out as good as I imagined in its digital form. So let's talk about the process. Now, this is an example from another project currently in the works that shows stage-by-stage -stage process of a digital painting. So after I scan or photograph the original sketch of my drawing, I started by color blocking everything. At this stage, I just need to do the basic solid color block, mainly the big stuff, no details or textures yet. This is mainly just to get an overall visual of the whole painting. Once all the canvas are blocked with colors, the next thing to do is to add shades, shadows, and lightings. This is the stage where I will start adding dimension and depth to everything. It's really important that I decide before doing this, where is the main source of the light coming from, and also from what? Is it the sun? Is it the moon? If yes, what time is it? Morning? Noon? Midnight? That will determine the direction of the lighting. I also need to consider if there are any artificial lighting sources, such as street lamps, building windows, or any other reflective surfaces. In this example, I have decided that this scene will take place in the evening. So the overall light will be quite soft and even, but there will be a bright lamp post and an open window that will be the point of interest of the whole painting. At this stage, I've also started adding some textures to define some dark and light areas of everything. Next is texture and details. Now this is the part that can either be very boring because things can be quite monotonous or can be quite fun, depends on the task. In this case, some of the boring part is that I have to draw every identical window frame and every little pillar below those window frames. But the fun part is I get to be really creative in designing the different window designs or adding ornamental details to the lampposts or drawing the pretty vegetation. From this point, I will basically just have to continue adding details and textures. As I go, I will also constantly improve the definition of highlights and shadows. This is also the part where I like experimenting with the colors. I like adding things that were not in the original sketch, so this is the most fun bit of the digital painting. Because as I bring my painting to life with details, my imagination will start to fill it up with things that I didn't plan to be there. Once I have the majority of elements drawn in my illustration, and everything is colored and textured, I always check my brightness and contrast values every now and then. I do this by making the whole illustration black and white, so that way I can see where are the dark areas, where are the light areas, and most importantly, where are the high contrast areas are sitting. Our eyes will always be drawn to the highest contrast. So knowing that the girl and this magical creature is the main focus of this story, I have to make sure that this area have the strongest contrast in comparison to its surroundings. So lighting is a really important part in my illustration style. Um, I do like using a quite dramatic lighting in general. Um, I find that using the right lighting can really help you tell a story um, through your illustration um, because you can enhance um, certain feelings or emotion or you can even change um, an existing feeling that you originally started in your drawing like making something sad like this into more kind of like a bittersweet so I put a lot of attention in all of the lighting features in my illustration so things like um, reflection on the windows on metallic surfaces um, or you know like um, I've added like some more lighting features here like inside the train carriage and you see those um, blurred lanterns there they're supposed to be like outside of the train so on the platform on the other side um, and like this glare over here it could be from the sun or like some uh, street lighting on the other platform so things like these uh, really really bring focus um, and tells a better story um, in your illustration um, so my favorite lighting setting in general is um, usually and also in real life like in the morning um, from like you know early morning sunrise to like around maybe 8 a.m. or in the afternoon um, between like 
three to maybe six or whenever the sun sets it depends on which time zone you are um, and then of course in the evening because that's where you can actually add a lot of like artificial lighting um, features so like in this example as well like um, I think um, this is an illustration I did for a couple of friends of mine so I wanted to be um, quite romantic so this is supposed to be a wedding gift so it's really important for me to choose like a lighting setting that is quite romantic so maybe um, you know early morning or like twilight um, and using things like ray lights um, and then some glows um, it's really important to pay attention where the shadow falls as well um, so yeah I think things like this um, it really brings a lot into your drawing um, here again um, I think using the crack lighting also helps you bring focus to your drawing so as you can see here the main character it's obviously this old guy here with his dog um, and in the house and I've basically made sure that pretty much like things that are around like these three elements they're the brightest in terms of the contact contrast um, everything else is quite dark and um, or really light so the the contrast of the entire composition sits really in the middle um, this is also a pretty obvious example here um, so they're having like a um, cozy sleepover um, and then you know using like the right lighting make sure that oh you can really feel that they're having such a you know like a warm uh, cozy time together maybe they're like brothers or maybe they're like really close friends um, and this is as well like you know it's a I did this for um, I think for Halloween and you know this idea is supposed to be like a, a witch house you can see like there are black cats and crows but you know if you use the right lighting you can actually make the entire feeling less scary and then somewhat the story that you'll get from looking at this drawing is maybe the witch that lives in this house is more of like a you know a friendly witch maybe like uh, she's not really a bad witch um, and that's all because of like the lighting that I actually use in here which is kind of like a like a soft beautiful sunset so yeah I think um, in general for me like lighting plays a very important part um, in bringing focus creating um, depth and then also like tells a story um, to make sure that whatever it is the feeling that you want the audience to feel like you, they can actually feel it by just sensing like the lighting that is actually going on in the drawing so the way i transform my original hand sketch into a digital painting is i would take photo or scan the original sketch which is this one here um and then i would upload it into my computer um import it into my Adobe Photoshop software and then put it as an overlay on top and then I would start actually painting uh, below the original sketch so the original sketch would act as a guideline um, you can see here I have put it actually on top of the completed painting um, so the white line shows the original sketch and you can see I've actually had to make some adjustments um, you'll notice that the well in the original sketch is actually facing that direction um, see if you can see better there um, while the final uh, painting is actually facing this way. Um, that's something that I just kind of realized um, once I started painting them that it probably have a better flow if I actually make all the animals flows into one direction rather than like here and there. Um, you also notice that I've removed the octopus over here um, and I've also removed the jellyfish. Actually no, the jellyfish is still there. Um, no, the moon. I removed the moon. So things like that. There's, those are just the things that I decided to actually um take out or sometimes i added like other elements like these little cute planets um and then these little balls here so um you know it's something that i usually have to think um as i go and then see if if it works out or if i need to actually change this um another example here this is another sketch and so the black line shows the original sketch this one is mostly similar um with the exception of uh, so this you'll see there's a swan um, in a pond that I've decided to take out because um, once I started actually painting it, I realized it's taking too much space. It's, it's quite busy and I wanted the focus to be more on the wombat here. Um, I've added like this little caterpillar here. Um, you can see that so originally I was only drawing the little bandicoot eating the berries and then I thought like, oh, it would be cute. Maybe the bandicoot actually took the caterpillars like berries. Um, just, you know, adding those little like um, stories within the story itself. And yeah, so um, this is usually how I 
work um, with digital illustration. Um, it depends, like, I don't always do it this way if it's like a pretty straightforward drawing, but if it's quite complicated, I would always do it this way, so with a sketch on top. So this is my um, work uh, setting interface. Um, so this is the Photoshop interface. So in the middle, I would have the canvas where I would be doing the drawing. Um, this is my color swatch. This is where I pick all the colors that I need. Over here is a massive collection of um, my Photoshop brushes. Um, so if you're not familiar with Photoshop brushes um, at the moment, like it's really amazing what these Photoshop brushes can do. They can actually mimic a real life um, painting. So there's a brush for watercolor, for acrylic, for oil. And once you actually paint on the screen, they will actually behave and mix like an actual paint. And I'll show you later, like um, in a demonstration after this. And then over here on the left is my um, layers. You can see um, I'm not very organized with my layers because when you started drawing on this scale, you can have like tons and tons of layers and then you can group them and organize them if you want. But sometimes I just kind of like, uh, you know, started with organizing them properly. And then like after like few hours of work, I just kind of give up. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the interface and I'll show you like how to actually use this interface um, just very quickly so you can see the working process. All right, I'll show you a bit of a demo um, of the digital painting process. So I've taken the original sketch and put it there. Um, so you can see this layer here is where the sketch is and I will create a layer below it. So just there and this is the layer where I'm actually going to draw. So this is my color palette here. So I'm going to choose a bit of a gray and I'm going to start coloring the wombat. So you can actually see that as I start coloring the wombat, um, the sketch actually remains there as a guide and that will help me to make sure that I know um, the areas that I need to color. Um, so I can do things like that manually or Photoshop also have a tool, like kind of a selection tool where I can actually just select the parts that I want. Don't know if you can see the slides, but see like now it's creating a selection and I can just color everything quickly um, and I can refine everything later. So let's do, I'm gonna create another layer for the facial feature. I usually like to separate them. So now let's do the nose. I'm gonna make it a bit of a pink color there. Yeah. And then... start giving like some highlights so I can always hide the sketch layer if I want if I want to see a clear picture of the painting and I can always turn them on later like that and then let's draw the eyes so over here like I've got all the brushes that I normally use. Um, so for each project, usually there is a specific brush that I constantly use and I usually put them over here, but I can always access the full collection of the brush as well if I need. So let's do the eyes. So actually maybe it's better to just hide the layer so I can see clearly. there and then the eyebrow and then let's see where's the fringe so the fringe over there let's give it a bit of a so you can see that I actually don't always have the sketch on when I'm drawing sometimes like I just kind of like to go a bit of a freehand and then not really follow the sketch exactly, like line by line. Um, that's just like something that it kind of depends case by case. Yeah, um, let's also add colors on his ears. And let's add the 
out this well. See, it's starting to take shape. Um, and then let's do a bit of a coloring um, to create the fur texture of his body. So I use this brush here that creates this kind of like dotted textures um, that gives a bit of a kind of like dirty earthy feel to the wombat um, and then so I do that let's turn on the sketch to see the face is over there so you know this is just a bit of a quick demo um, so as you can see I'm not really following um, the stages that I showed you earlier with the color block and everything because um, I'm just gonna try to show you a quick demo otherwise it will take forever to actually do that um, so like that and then I've got a brush here as well that can actually give kind of a scratchy furry texture Forgetting. Oh, we forgot the his, his rosy cheeks. Maybe the same color as the nose. There we go, and then let's add his body as well. So yeah, you know, um, this is just a very quick demo of the whole process. Um, each page usually takes me about six to 10 hours. It depends on how complex they are. Um, but yeah, so this is pretty much how it's actually being drawn um, on a computer. Um, it still takes a long time because usually that's just like a really quick demonstration, but I'll spend like a lot of time refining like the fur, the details, the edges and everything. Um, and yeah, I think, um, it's quite fun and I personally always think that this process is the most enjoyable and also like quite relaxing to me. So the printing and setup of a book is the most technical part of the whole process and even though it's being done towards the end, it's something that I have to be aware from the beginning and I'll tell you why. The first one is about page count. If you think of a spread of a book, um, like this paper, and then fold it in a half, you can imagine this as a book, and then if you open it, you'll see that you'll have page one, page two, and then if you flip it, page three and four. So when you're printing a sheet of paper like this, you will have to know that automatically it will have four pages, whether you like it or not. So that means if, as an illustrator, I decided to break the book into just like three pages, there will be like one blank pages left. If I decided to break it into just two pages, then I will have actually two pages blank. And that's something that I have to consider from the very beginning. I've made the mistake the first time I did a children's book without really knowing this, and then I end up with so many blank pages. And I've had, so I had to learn that the hard way. The other thing that I have to consider is the spine of the book, how thick it is. Um, luckily, this book is not very thick, but um, if you have a thick book and you open it, the middle part of the book will actually sink quite deep so I don't want to put like any text near the spine of the book because it's going to actually sink into the middle. I also have to consider about the placement of the text in general. If there are any text too close to the edges, will it get trimmed? And also like the cover, like what's going to be like, how thick, what material and all that stuff. Uh, we'll talk about that more. So this area highlighted in yellow is the center of the book where the spine and the binding of the book sits. Depends on how thick and what type of binding, but in general, a portion of that area will kind of sink into the middle. So we don't want to put any important elements on or near this area. This area around the pages are called the safe area margins. 
In general, it's okay to have things in this area, but from both visual and technical purposes, we don't want to put any important things like text or elements that won't look good when it's cropped. You can think of this safe area as like a yellow light or a warning area, where there is a possibility things might get cropped during printing, so it's best to not put anything important over here. Now, these thin areas similar to the safe area margins are called bleed. In printing, bleed area is usually an extension of your page, about 5mm wide where it will most definitely get streamed during the printing process. The reason printing needs bleed is because most printer would print an artwork on a large sheet roll and then the pages get streamed after. And to avoid any white borders on the edges of the printed pages, the trimming will happen about 5mm towards the inside of the page. So bleed area is definitely area you don't want to put anything important. Thanks for tuning in and watching my video. I hope that gives you a good insight on what happened behind the scene of the book. If you want to buy the two books that I've illustrated, both written by Sam, you can go to Sam's website. Uh, we've got two books. The first one is One But Wiggle, the one we just talked about. And the second one is called Gigi Goes to Town. This was our first book released in 2019. Uh, it's a story about a giraffe who lives in the zoo but doesn't feel like she belongs there. So she decided to go for an adventure in the city. Um, I would really encourage you to support literacy in children, uh, especially with the rise of technology in some parts of the world. There's been a decline in children's interest in reading, so let's keep the interest up. If you want to check more of my works or invite me for a collaboration, you can check my Instagram and my website page as well. So hopefully see you for the next book. Bye!